In the early 2000s, three young girls were abducted, tortured, abused, and raped by a sadistic, sex-addicted scumbag on Cleveland's west side. Today, we'll tell the stories of Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Gina De Jesus, as well as look at the nightmare they endured for 10 years of their lives. We'll also discuss the life of Ariel Castro, his eventual arrest, and how it all came to an end. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. You've heard us use the tagline sarcastically in the past, but stick around. Tonight, you'll hear the story of some authentic hometown heroes, some of the strongest and bravest young women ever to come out of Cleveland. This is Necronomapod. It is a story we followed for 10 years, and tonight we're following breaking news. Three women that vanished have been found alive. And right now, those three women, Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus, and Michelle Knight, are here at Metro Health Medical Center, being tended to by doctors and also being reunited with family members, Danita. Well, right now, let's take a look at this photo. It was just taken just a short time ago of Amanda Berry in her hospital room. She is surrounded by family members. Police found Berry, De Jesus, and Michelle Knight at a home on Seymour Avenue on Cleveland's west side. All three girls were last seen near the area of West 110th Street and Lorraine Avenue. So, Dave, as you kind of alluded to in the intro, we have uh, some hometown heroes, and I think we also got to kind of dub this episode uh, Hometown Sleazebag as well, right? It's a combination of both. Legitimate hometown heroes this time, though. You know, we've referenced our pal Dahmer and whoever else is hometown heroes. <laughs> but. Who's Dahmer? <laughs> Never heard of him. The no. guy down the road that was from here. But yeah. Oh, okay. Legitimate heroes. This we have time. to cover him one day. Um, yeah. Who, who wants to tell him? <laughs> and on the other side of the story, we got a, you know, a real piece of shit. I, I don't know, man. This guy's just vile. Just well, and this one hits a little vile. You know, no pun intended. This one hits a little closer to home for us because it's, you know, we saw this on our local news every single day for, you know, Years and years. Yeah, I, I grew up in the neighborhood where these girls got uh, taken from. So, yeah, as absolutely. Did as did I. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when Amanda Berry went missing, that was all over the place. You know, was, oh, yeah. So, yeah, this one's a little bit more, uh, you know, personal for us, just in the sense of we kind of live through the day by day timelines for, for quite a few years. So, yeah. Anyways, not the uh, the funnest of subjects as a lot of the issues or the uh, topics we've covered in the past. So. Not a whole lot of joking and fun to be had throughout this one. No, not, not, not at all. Is this a widely known story, though? I guess some of these local stories, I'm not sure as to how much or how widely known this is across the country. When they were found, I was on vacation in fucking Florida, of all places. Mm. And it was breaking news on TV there. Oh, yeah. It was on all. Scene yeah. But, so you widely know. I mean, we're breaking news nationwide. Yeah. So. I mean, this has to be at least known, right? Yeah, I think I've seen some other some people say stuff like uh, they've heard of it, like they know yeah. of it, but they don't know much about it at yeah. all. I think we know a ton about it just because it's local. I think that's right. Yeah, which I think is common for just any story. You know, we always get people recommending subjects that are local to them and they know a ton about it because yeah. when it's local, it you know, you just hear about it more. Right. So anyways, let's dive in. Michelle Knight was the first girl to disappear in Cleveland, Ohio in 2002. She was born April 23rd, 1981, and was originally from Florida, but through life, she had eventually moved to Cleveland. Her family was very poor and sometimes homeless throughout her childhood. For a period of time, the family lived in a station wagon with her parents, her twin brother, and a cousin. They eventually found a more stable living situation in renting a house, but the poverty level didn't change much. They didn't have access to running water, so things like washing clothes or showering or brushing teeth were a pretty rare thing. Uh, Michelle got picked on in school because she smelled, and at the same time as dealing with all of these struggles, she was the one caring for her twin brother and her cousin. Can I just point out that you know some people might say, why would you move from Florida to Cleveland? The weather in Cleveland is far superior to Florida. I just want to put that out there. I agree. See you guys next week. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about Michelle, too, and you were you pointed this out before we started recording, Dave, is we know so much more about her backstory because she's been the most vocal one. I think that's right. Yeah. You know, it, when, as we get into this, we're not going to have this 
amount of detail on Amanda Barry or Gina DeJesus. Yeah. Michelle was really good at drawing, uh, specifically drawing wolves. And she was really into reading Stephen King books and watching horror movies when she could see them. And this was the stuff that she used to zone out and escape what was going on around her. When they got in this house, it was pretty much a revolving door for other relatives. And from an early age, a male relative started to sexually abuse her. She didn't have a bedroom. It was kind of a sleep wherever you could find a spot situation. And she got to the point where she would try to hide in closets and things like that from this guy at night. But he always found her and assaulted her. When she was 15, she had enough of the abuse. And one night she slipped two sleeping pills into his drink. When he passed out, Michelle put some of her things in a book bag and snuck out the window and ran away. So at this point, Michelle was 15 years old and homeless. She started sleeping under an overpass and had stolen a garbage can to sleep in. She's a really short girl, like four seven. So she fit in the garbage can and was able to put the lid on it at night. Also, pretty early on into being homeless, she either found or stole a baseball bat to use as protection. Yeah, I imagine that's important. Yeah, fifteen under years an underpass. Old, uh, you're you know you're you're living that way. It's unreal. It really is. It's yeah. so sad. I came into May like I was trying to figure out where to find some joints when I was fifteen. Uh, you know. Yeah. How to sleep under an overpass, like, you know? You know, it's I was horrific. fucking worried about sure. getting home in time to watch TRL, you know, before it ended on MTV. And there's people with like real problems, you know, going on. Yep. Yeah. And when I was writing this, I was like, I was thinking that kind of same stuff. And I don't know if it was hitting different just because it's local, but it's like this where this has happened. It's like 30 minutes away from us, 40 mm-hmm. minutes, if that. Yeah. So. This is literally, and I know Dave for you too. This is two blocks away for where i spent the first seven years of my life i i mean and up until the last few years i went to we're going to get into it in a little bit but the burger king she worked at pretty regularly yeah. not really necessarily putting the connection together but yeah, yeah like I, don't know, I was in that area all the time eventually michelle was noticed by a man that was part of a baptist church in cleveland that michelle nicknamed arsenio because the guy looked like arsenio hall he told her that the church gave out meals once a day and he invited her to come by. This at least gave Michelle some food that wasn't garbage or something that she was you know, begging for and a place to interact with people who she said were all really nice. Arsenio Hall, also from Cleveland. Is all he? the coolest people from come from Cleveland. Yeah, I think so. See, see the cool one of the coolest people. Oh, I mean, <laughs> Steve Harvey, of course, is oh, yeah. Steve another, Harvey, another also Cleveland, from Cleveland. Yeah. but uh, oh, OK, it's Cleveland against the world, man. This isn't our proudest moment, though, however. <laughs> tonight, no. <laughs> do not judge us based on this. Or Anthony Sowell. Yeah, that's People have requested one. him a bunch. Yeah, yeah, that's on the list. That's, mm-hmm. uh... Let's give us a break. It's a, <laughs> it's a lot of Ohio humbling here today. And, you know, Florida's got their Casey Anthony. We have our Ariel Castro. <laughs> this routine of going to the church for a meal once a day went on for a while until Michelle was approached by a guy who called himself Sniper. Okay, pal. <laughs> I bet he didn't have any tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> you anti-tattoo yeah. bastard. I was like, what are you implying here? No, nothing. I was simply making an observation, and I think you guys would agree that I'm not wrong. You probably had a few tattoos. That's all I'm saying. I, I once had a tattoo guy tell me that everyone that lives in a trailer park has a tattoo, but not everyone that has a tattoo lives in a trailer park. Yes, I th- yeah. <laughs> I've heard some variations of that, like substituting substituting trailer park for white trash. Yeah, yeah. I actually that's, don't, a, that's a fair I, statement. I don't, uh, you know, I love tattoos. I think they're you know they're awesome. I just haven't been able to commit to one. I just happened to see this guy's name and thought he probably has some shitty tattoos. So that is all. That is all. Yeah, like a sniper. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But if you go around calling yourself sniper. Probably have some bad tattoos. Like a shitty drawing of an AR-15 or something. <laughs> <laughs> You're going real literal with that sniper thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Michelle's under this overpass holding on to her bat because she didn't know what this guy's intentions were. Um, and he told her that he wanted to help her, that he could give her a job as a drug runner. This immediately doesn't sound great. Um, but the sniper guy is actually really nice to Michelle. Sniper was around 18 or 19 years old, uh, according to Michelle, and he took her back to his house, showed her his bedroom, told her she could sleep there, that he would sleep on the couch. 
He also introduced her to another drug runner that was living there, uh, a guy from Saudi Arabia named Roderick, or went by Roderick. I don't know if that's his real name. And this is honestly the best situation Michelle uh, has had up to this point in her life. She had a roof over her head, a shower, uh, all the stuff people take for granted sometimes. These guys weren't abusing her or anything like that. Michelle and Roderick hit it off right away and became extremely close, but not in a sexual way. Uh, They were like brother and sister. Alabama listeners are like, what do you mean? (laughs) (laughs) I don't get it. (laughs) Again, I love how we have the balls to shit on another state during this episode. (laughs) They're like, yeah, you haven't done an episode about Alabama yet, motherfuckers. (laughs) For example... Roderick had been holding on to a hijab that belonged to his mother, and he eventually gave it to Michelle because he considered her family. So these two became really close. Roderick taught Michelle the ins and outs of drug running, like what to watch for, how to read someone's reactions to a situation, and how to use a gun in case things took a turn. Like uh, when Larry David tries to buy some uh, weed for his dad. (laughs) It's great. One of the best. Ian, sorry. You'll get there one day, pal. (laughs) You better hurry up, though. Yeah. One day, while Michelle wasn't at Sniper's house, the police raided it, and Roderick ended up getting away. Michelle ran into Roderick a couple blocks away, and since both of them didn't have a place to go, Michelle took Roderick to the overpass she used to sleep under. Lucky. She got Roderick a garbage can and kind of taught him the ins and outs of being homeless. Uh, The two of them were homeless together for about a week, when a woman who lived in Michelle's neighborhood saw her and went back to tell Michelle's father where she was. Her father brought her back home, and it's back to the same life she was living before. This male relative started abusing her again, just back to everything we talked about before. Mm. And this had gone on for, I think, uh, close to a year, because she's around 16 at this time. At 17, Michelle got pregnant. She said that she had been dating a guy, but this guy had another girlfriend and he chose to stay with the other girl instead of Michelle. This is also around the time that she started to physically fight back against the male family member who was abusing her, which led to him eventually stopping. Michelle's son Joseph was born on October 24th, 1999, and around this time, Michelle's father left the house. Her mother started dating a guy named Carlos who who ended up moving in. Um, Carlos was an alcoholic, like all day, every day drinker. Um, and one day he had to watch Joseph who would be around like two going on three at this point because Michelle's mother was at work and Michelle had to turn in some job applications. Joseph was running around and throwing a fit for Michelle to get back home. And Carlos reached out, grabbing Joseph by the leg, breaking it. This girl can't catch a break. Fuck. It's tough when you don't win the family lottery like that, you know? You're just what born you into do? a situation. Yeah. It's just awful all around. Everyone's awful. Joseph was taken to the hospital where obviously nurses and doctors wanted to know what happened to this little boy, like how his leg got broken. Carlos admitted to breaking Joseph's leg that he didn't mean to grab him so hard, but the hospital got CPS involved and Joseph was put into foster care. So now at this point, we're we're in 2002. Michelle's son was bouncing around to different foster homes that were in different areas of Cuyahoga County, which Cuyahoga County makes up a ton of suburbs. I mean, people forget back in the old days, Cleveland was the fourth biggest city in the country behind New York, L.A. and Chicago. Well, obviously, it was a big deal because the mob used to meet in Cleveland, Dave, between Chicago and New York. Well, yeah, it's a whole history in itself. Like with Rockefeller and the steel industry and all. I mean, Cleveland was big. Yeah, it was huge. But and to what what you were saying, like Cuyahoga County now, there's tons of suburbs involved. Like it's, you know, you can drive 45 minutes from downtown Cleveland and still be in Cuyahoga County. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. And (laughs) if you drive like a grandma like you, Mike. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm known for my grandma driving skills. (laughs) As of Dave's ever driven with me. And we've ever been in a car, we've been fucking drunk in the back seat. <laughs> While someone chauffeurs our ass around. The foster homes, it's not like she just went, or her son just went to one. Those things switch up a lot. I think oh, I can't even Very imagine. regularly. Yeah. 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 I think more than people think, or at least more than I thought, and then I, when I was reading about Michelle's story, 
Well, I don't think there's much of a commitment that the, the foster parents need to make. Like if they're having trouble or they don't like it, they could just, you know, yeah. no, this isn't working out. And they get moved to someplace else. It's not a lot of stability for the kids. Yeah. I mean, if you find a good foster home, sure. Yeah. And not to bag on foster parents because there's yeah. a lot of great foster parents. But uh, right. And, and some of them are just trying to get that monthly check from the county, too. So they're <laughs> there is you know, piling up that, kids right. in their house. and Right. And most I think most of the foster parents are in it for the right intentions. But, you know. There's also times where there's other foster kids in the home and they might be looking out for the other kid's best interest. And if someone else comes in and is causing a ruckus, you get them moved, yeah. you know, and it's, it, it could not, you know, obviously it's not a good, stable environment. If you get lucky and you find, you know, a good foster sure. home, then that's best case scenario. So Michelle had scheduled visits with her son at these foster homes uh, and these were monitored but they were scheduled around the foster home schedule, not Michelle's. And she didn't have a car. So like we were just saying, Cuyahoga County is huge. Yeah. For, you can be 45 minutes yeah. away. And how are you going to get in the bus system? I, well, you know, public transportation in Cleveland is shit. Right. If you're going west, anything past the airport, you know, you better hope the RTA system gets you out there, which it might, but on a very rigid schedule. Well, and like you get into the outer ring suburbs, like our town out here doesn't even have public transportation. Well, I'm saying Cuyahoga County, though. Yeah, but yeah. I'm saying just outside of there. Yeah. One might say that that's uh, overtly racist because they're trying to keep people from the city out of our town out here. And one might say that's why there's no public transportation out here. One might say. One might say that. One might be correct if, when they say <laughs> yeah. that. Just one man's opinion. One might say. <laughs> But you're right. The infrastructure of uh, public transportation leaves a lot to be just, desired in the in the regional area. And I just meant from the statement of like she might be dying to see her kid. But one, she has like to work, you know, or do something sure. to, to live Two, It's on the foster home schedule. And if you know, if you're you know, if you're on the west side of Cleveland and they're living in a home on the east side of Cleveland, you can't get there quickly. Even if the bus did go there, that's another hour and a half to get there. You know, your whole day could be revolving around trying to get to that appointment and you might not be able to make yeah. that work. You know, you're living hand yeah. to mouth. The point being, once you get into that system and that cycle, it's tough. Kinda, it's tough. It's sure. extremely tough. And, and like any missed visit would count as a knock against her. Right. In yeah. this situation. Sure. Right. At this time, Michelle also moved out of her mother's house to show CPS that her son wasn't going back to a dangerous environment. Michelle moved in with her cousin, Lisa who was 10 years older than her, and it was a really supportive situation. Since Michelle wasn't familiar with anyone in the neighborhood, Lisa introduced Michelle to her cousin, Deanna, who Michelle didn't really know at all, and a girl named Emily Castro, whose father, Ariel, worked as a school bus driver. On August 23, 2002, Michelle had a court-ordered appointment regarding getting her son back. Michelle was having trouble finding the office, she called the office and they basically told her, figure it out for yourself. Michelle went into a family dollar that was close by to see if someone in there knew where it was. Michelle was waiting in line and was told by the person working how to get to the office and waiting behind her was Ariel Castro. As Michelle was walking out, Ariel Castro approached her and said he overheard that she was having trouble finding that office and that he was trying to find a certain bank and asked her if she knew where it was. Michelle said she knew where it was, and for helping Castro, he offered to drive Michelle to the office. Michelle didn't really know Castro, but she knew his daughter, Emily, so she figured, why not? Plus, she was already on the verge of running late for this appointment, so she got in Castro's car, and at 21 years old, that would be the last time Michelle would be seen until 2013. Just as simple as that, too. That easy. Gone. Yeah. Trying to make an appointment to get her kids back. Kid back. And just happens to see this guy. Yeah, right. Amanda Berry was born April 22nd, 1986. And she was the next girl to go missing in the same area on April 21st, 2003. Amanda didn't live at the poverty level of Michelle Knight. But Amanda's father left and her mother struggled with bills. She worked multiple jobs to keep them with a roof over their heads. Um, and then there's not, at least not that I saw a ton about her childhood, but that she was really into clothes, like kept everything real organized and she wanted to be a clothing designer. I, I read this week, I read her, she did a book with, uh, so Michelle Knight wrote her own book and Amanda and Gina wrote their book and it was largely based on her notes from 
both of their notes, both of their notes from, from all this. And, but yeah, she said, uh, she had like all the, her shoes lined up by kinds and sizes and jeans and like categorized by color. Like, yeah, she was really into the fashion aspect. I think the FBI even commented on that when they ended up going to our house. Oh, did they? Yeah. In 2003, Amanda was working at Burger King. Her sister's husband was the manager of that Burger King. That Burger King is on 110th and Lorraine Avenue, which is four blocks from where Michelle Knight went missing. Amanda was in a really bad mood on this day because earlier her and her mother had gotten into a big fight. She was given the chance to leave for work early that day, so she took it. All that shit that lines up, you know? It's, it's just, such it's, mundane shit, and it just ends in... Like, if you'd have left, if you would have worked your full shift, like, this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Like it's hard to come to grips with that, I think, later. Amanda was waiting outside trying to get a hold of her boyfriend to come pick her up, but he wasn't answering. So as she's standing there texting her boyfriend, a guy in a maroon van pulled up and asked her if she needed a ride. Amanda was in a really bad mood, couldn't get a hold of her boyfriend. She figured, fuck it. I know this guy's daughter. She's one of my friends. Her name's Angela Castro. This whole targeting your daughter's friends stuff is extra creepy. Fucking crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. It's it's such a vulnerable point because you would never think the dad of one of your friends yes. would do something like this. You ever think like growing up back then you would, of course you would you know, jump in a car with one of your friend's parents. Yeah. You well, then think twice about it. Part of you also, you know, then you got to think about how premeditated was this? You know, he happened to be behind Michelle in line, you know, when she was going to an appointment that she was walking to. He happened to be outside Amanda's work when she got out. Yeah. Like, th that's two big coincidences. Uh, so, you know, was had to be in stalking them for a while. Mm hmm. Once Amanda was in the car, Ariel Castro commented on the phone that she had. It was nice. And I guess 2003 is still pretty rare to have. Yeah, a not phone. everyone had a phone. Sure. Like not every teenager. I didn't have a phone until 2004. For the record. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, well, you're a dork. You're a home watching wrestling. What do you need a phone for? <laughs> yeah. To test my buddy to be like, hey, did you just see Mick Foley get thrown off that Hell in a Cell? Or, you know, whatever else was going on. I don't remember when I got a phone. Probably around the same time you did. See? Actually, yeah. You're going to make fun of him too now? <laughs> we could have been texting about wrestling. I didn't have a phone in high school either. That's okay. You had a page. They, did, though, right? they didn't exist in high school. Your high school <laughs> days, Dave. You went out to the uh, the old pay phone. <laughs> I did have a pager though, yeah. I remember you saying that before. 911. Pa page me 911 if it's an emergency. Is that what you guys did? Is that, <laughs> sure. is that, was that cool back then? Is that what you guys did? <laughs> Did you also spell boobs on your calculator? <laughs> I think that was so fucking sweet. Of course we did. <laughs> and in my day, we could just text each other pictures of boobs. And then like, it's a lot cooler. So Ariel Castro asked her if he wanted, if, if she wanted to go hang out with his daughter. Um, Amanda said, sure, why not? So they headed to Castro's house at 2207 Seymour Avenue. As they pulled up to the house, Castro asked Amanda if he could check out her phone. She said, sure. And while looking at it, he goes, oh, wait, let me get my dog out of the way. Castro had a chow that was chained up outside. And from all accounts, it was not a very nice dog. So as Castro's doing this, he pockets Amanda's phone because she's not even paying attention at this point. She's looking at a barking dog. <laughs> and that was the last time anyone saw Amanda until... 2013. That takes us to April 2nd, 2004, where Gina De Jesus went missing at 14 years old. Gina was born February 13th, 1990. At the time, Gina lived with her parents, her brother, sister, and her sister's two kids. And from all accounts, it was a very happy, stable family situation. Gina was really shy and had some learning difficulties, so she was placed into classes at her school to help her out. This resulted in her having to ride a different bus to school, and kids being assholes made fun of her for riding the short bus. So the routine was that Gina's father would drop her off early at school on his way to work to avoid kids making fun of her, and she would have to wait outside for a bit before being let in. Even though Gina was really shy and had... Um, some learning issues. She was doing really well in school and her teachers were getting to the point that they were thinking that she could move to regular classes. 
And this was something that Gina was really excited about because she wanted to be the first person from her family to go to college. So she's on the right path and she's doing everything right in life. The car that Gina's father drove was a white Nissan that he bought from the father of Gina's friend, Arlene Castro. On April 2nd, 2004, Gina had gotten out of school and she was outside hanging out with Arlene Castro. And the two of them decided that they wanted to go roller skating. But then it hits Gina that she can't do that because she was grounded for getting caught smoking cigarettes in her room. Then Arlene said, well, maybe you can come by my house. So Arlene used the payphone nearby, but this didn't seem like it was going to work out. So they just decided to go home. They went their both ways. As Gina was walking home, a Jeep Grand Cherokee pulled up and it was Arlene's father, Ariel Castro. He told Gina he was looking for Arlene and Gina was like, yeah, I just saw her. She's walking home. Castro asked Gina if she wanted a ride. And I, this is a little different level of trust in that um, vulnerability because Gina was really good friends with Arlene. So she got in no questions asked. It's like a family friend, more or less. Right. Yeah. That would be like somebody in our group of friends. I would have no issue with my son getting in the car with somebody in our group of friends. It's crazy. If they they ran into him walking and said, you want to ride? I'd be like our good friend, Jared from just brew coffee. I would be like, I wouldn't even think twice about Mm -hmm. having an issue with something like that. For the record, just brew coffee is not in the industry of abducting kids. (laughs) (laughs) Fine establishment with delicious coffee. (laughs) But I, I guess I don't, I wouldn't want ever want one of those friends to, to pick up your kids because it just teaches them. I don't know. Like you can't teach your kids not to get in the cars with people and then have exceptions like that. You know what I mean? Or like without a, a, a safe word or a, a password yeah. that only they would know. But I could see my son. Yeah. Well, sure. Him. Yeah. Like absolutely. if you drove past him, he would definitely hop in the car. Yeah. yeah. Right. I just would never do that. Cause I think it breeds kind of complacency for getting in the cars with people you shouldn't. Yeah. I see that point. I'd be like, walk, walk home, lazy ass. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you, lazy as your fucking dad? Walk home. <laughs> God damn. So like he'd verbally abuse your kid. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely wouldn't get in a car with Jared from Just Brew. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> I'm here to defend himself. <laughs> So Gina got in the car with no questions, and that was the last time Gina was seen until 2013. Gina went missing from 105th in Lorraine, so now you have girls disappearing from 105th, 106th, and 110th in Lorraine. They all have a connection to daughters of Ariel Castro. Investigators had figured out that Amanda and Gina were kidnapped by the same person because there was just too many... uh, to make coincidences with that. But Michelle wasn't connected to the search at all. And Michelle, again, was the first one abducted. She was a little bit older um, and had kind of been on her own and on the streets for some time, at least during her upbringing, like homeless for a year. Right. Yeah. And like you said, she was a little bit older. Amanda and Gina, they had family. This is unfortunate to say, but they had family that missed them um, and they were underage. Michelle was taken off the missing persons list after about a year. So she was never connected to this at all. I don't know what the logistics of that are like, but I would just argue maybe just keep keep her on there a little bit longer, maybe. I swear I had read that they weren't even certain her family ever even reported her missing. Oh, really? So like well, maybe they yeah. assumed she ran away again. Not, yeah. not to justify their actions, sure, sure. but they maybe th- thought that. David Politis would have got them on a missing persons list. Yeah. If only he investigated inner city missing people. <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't. I saw we say he doesn't investigate shit. He just puts together lists. Yeah. So, isn't it unusual to target people within your own sphere, though? Like, it's just it seems unusual to me. Like to target all like three people that know your daughters or are considered semi to close friends with your daughters, as opposed to like just being random. You think? Yeah, I don't. Like, I would feel like somehow they could connect the dots to me with this. Which is why I talk I about the know. premeditation. Every situation, they were incidentally by themselves in an area where they were supposed to be. Yeah. How much, you know, research and, and you know, stalking did he do ahead of time? Well, like for, for uh, you know, Amanda outside her work. So he probably knew she was there. 
yeah. uh, with Gina, like, you know, was playing with her, his daughter. The Michelle Knight one is the, the crazy one because she was going to an appointment. So maybe he was following yeah. her because she was walking. <clears throat> he, he, she was only kind of briefly introduced right. to her to, yeah. to his daughter it wasn't like they hung out all the time or anything but it's just weird how he you know in my opinion probably stalked them to oh, find without out a doubt, you know, yeah. when would be the best time to strike so oh, yeah not only is it people you know but now you're you're following them and you're you know you're watching them and studying them to figure out when you're going to make your move like i feel like there's enough data points here that a good analytics program could have triangulated on the sky with all the information if something like that was available. Yeah. But it, but, like but everything's like there. Said, but you don't always look for the people the closest then. That's like what this, I mean. That's yeah. what blows this even more. Like you might be looking like the perverts in the area are, you know, but. Which is exactly what they did. Yeah. But you don't look at the ones who, you know, were close to home for them and people that they trust or a couple of them trusted. Like they ended up bringing in, um, We'll get into it later, but Castro's ex-wife, they ended up bringing in her new husband and question him. And he swears that he said, I don't know why you're talking to me. You should go talk to her ex-husband. That guy's nuts. And the FBI says, yeah, he never said that. So who's telling the truth? I don't know. Mm. But yeah, it was all there. We'll be right back. Ariel Castro was born July 10th, 1960 in Dewey, Yauco, Puerto Rico to Pedro Castro and Lillian Rodriguez. Castro's parents divorced when he was a child, and he moved to mainland United States with his mother and three siblings. They moved to Reading, Pennsylvania, and then moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where Castro's father and other family members were living. In total, Castro had nine siblings, both full and half, and he graduated from Cleveland's Lincoln West High School in 1979. Castro met his girlfriend, Grimilda Figueroa, when his family moved into a house across the street from hers in the 1980s. They lived with both sets of parents, but moved into their own home at 2207 Seymour Avenue in 1992. And that's where all of this takes place. The home was a two-story, 1,400 square foot, uh, four bedrooms, one bathroom house, with a 760 square foot unfinished basement. It was built in 1890 and remodeled in 1956. I mean, for context, it's just outside of downtown Cleveland a little bit. Like down the Not street even from the West Side drive. Market. Yeah, right. or, yeah, Within a five minute drive of the Cleveland Zoo. Sure. Yeah. Grimilda's sister, Alita Caraballo, said that, quote, all hell started breaking loose when the couple moved into their new home. Caraballo and her husband Frank said that Castro beat Grimilda, breaking her nose, ribs, and arms, and causing a blood clot in her brain that resulted in an inoperable tumor. He also threw her down a flight of stairs, cracking her skull. Then in 1993, Castro was arrested for domestic violence, but was not indicted by a grand jury. Like, this guy was fucking brutal beating her. Yeah. Like, yeah. badly, very badly. Like, probably easily could have killed her at one point. Yeah, like boot kicking her in the head after she came back from the hospital after treatment for that brain stuff. Like, just vile fucking scumbag stuff. Grimilda moved out of the home in 1996 and gained custody of their four children. The move of Grimilda and the kids was a pretty stressful day, and Ariel Castro was being very aggressive. Police assisted in the move and detained Castro, but they did not press any charges. And he went on to continue to threaten and attack Grimilda after she left him, according to uh, Grimilda's sister. If only there were warning signs. <laughs> right. right. There's always warning signs. Grimilda filed charges in 2005 in Cuyahoga County Domestic Relations Court, accusing Castro of inflicting multiple severe injuries on her and of, quote, frequently abducting their daughters. The court granted her a temporary restraining order against Castro, but it was dismissed a few months later. Grimilda ended up dying in April 2012 due to complications from her brain tumor. Which he caused. Mm -hmm. I mean, he should have right. been charged with murder. He killed her. He right. killed her. And restraining orders are a joke. No, well, Sure, of course. Yeah. That's a whole thing in and of itself, an issue. I have a restraining order against Mike. He's sitting across yeah. the table from me. And, uh, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> means nothing. What are you going to do? Castro did a lot of odd jobs, but at 52 years old, he worked as a bus driver for the Cleveland Metropolitan School District until he was fired for, quote, bad judgment. 
including making an illegal U-turn with kids on the bus, using the bus to go grocery shopping, leaving a child on the bus while he went out for lunch, and leaving the bus unintended while he took a nap at home. Yeah, I would say any one of those would be grounds for dismissal. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, wait here. I'm going to run into a fucking Taco Bell and go eat lunch. You just sit on this bus. Also, a U-turn with the school bus doesn't sound safe. Or easy to do. Or easy to do. (laughs) Like, I mean, what kind of big ass road are you doing that? Or are you just like backing up, going forward, backing up, you know, like, (laughs) okay, Pally. From accounts, he was a really good bass player uh, and was in a salsa band. So it wasn't like this guy was just like hidden away in this house all the time. I mean, he was out in the world interacting with people. Yeah. And we'll hear, are we playing that interview later? With the Charles Mm -hmm. Ramsey one? Like, Mm -hmm. he hung out with his neighbors. Like, he was a social guy. He did all kinds of stuff. In 2013, when this all went down, Castro's home was in foreclosure after three years of unpaid real estate taxes, even though he had a washing machine full of cash. The windows on the house were all covered with either cardboard or blankets, and random doors were bolted shut. Whenever he had people over, they were only allowed in certain areas of the house, mainly the kitchen. It didn't seem like many people got past his kitchen. Uh, he didn't have many people over, but ones uh, he did were basically, and even family members said, like, yeah, he's really weird, but he is who he is, I guess. Well, you don't suspect something like this. Like, he's a weird guy, but you're not thinking, oh, he's got three prisoners in, you know, his no. house. Just, he's a weird dude. It's a dirty yeah, house. Yeah, you don't think this, but I feel like... You'd be like, why has this guy got all these doors locked? Like, why is every Well, but fucking if it's also a locked? filthy house, too, you probably don't even ask that many questions. That's true. Because, yeah, that's the thing. It's, like, was, maybe he's embarrassed by his house, or maybe yeah. he shits behind that door just on the floor. He's a hoarder. Yeah. It's just one of those guys. Well, the house was absolutely disgusting. Oh, it was yeah. filthy. It was covered in garbage. Right. Hoarder-like. Yeah. Uh, and he rarely ever bathed, too. That was another thing that people said. So he probably didn't have clean clothes because he kept all that cash in the washing machine. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) When he brought the girls back to the house, restraining them was pretty much the same. Every time he would chain them to a support beam in the basement and put a sock in their mouth with duct tape as a gag. And then a motorcycle helmet so that no one would hear them scream. I don't know how people do that. Like I literally gag within 10 seconds of something being in my mouth. But they probably were like, I would just throw up and suffocate. I I don't know how people do that. I mean, but I think at that point, then what you you swallow it or you die. Right. So you probably swallow the the, the vomit. I think I would aspirate it and I think I would suffocate. Yeah. I mean, maybe, but I I don't know. I mean, the breathing can't be you have a dirt and you know, it's dirty. So you have a dirty sock in your mouth, duct taped. And then look, I'm not saying this is the easiest. I'm just saying, you know, this is. You know, live or die type yeah. situation. They're doing whatever they can to survive. And when I picture a motorcycle helmet, what I picture at least is like that more sporty looking kind. Yeah, like an over the face yeah. helmet. Yeah. So you we're not talking like just like the right, the like open a Sun's face. Anarchy top of the head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or like of, an open right, face right. type. Like you're talking, you know, like the, the visor that comes down, yeah. right. closed helmet. Like I said, I read that book and everything was disgusting. Like you know, everything, everything about this is disgusting and vile. Yeah. I can't even. It's unimaginable. Uh, The girls were beaten, raped, given a bucket to use as a bathroom, which Casho rarely emptied. He just covered it with uh, cardboard. That's what I read. And that went on for most of their time there. Like They didn't get to use the bathroom. They had to shit in a bucket like in the room and sat there all day. Like it's terrible. Like more than a week. It wasn't emptied. Yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like it's and just the so, most if, vile if thing even imaginable. A week, like who knows how long he let it go at times, you know, maybe just like yeah. before throwing it out or whatever he did with it. I can barely pick up my dog's shit when I take her for a walk. Yes, Dave, we know your <laughs> thoughts on dirty assholes. <laughs> to, be <in> and, a <laughs> room, yeah. to be in a room with a bucket of shit, I, I just, I, I, I really can't imagine. I, I don't know. These girls are um, and, unbelievable. You get, you know, I, I just feel like it just becomes your way of life, like you know, and you you just yeah. you don't want to accept it, but that's just what it is at that moment. Yeah, I just, and yeah. so you you know, and I I don't know, I can't put myself in that mindset or or what they. It's just an I, unbelievable willpower to to survive. Yeah. Oh, I I wouldn't have wanted. I wouldn't have survived. 
I would have just probably taken myself out pretty quickly. I don't think I could have either. Yeah. Which just, you know, goes to speak of their strength and what they yeah. the fact that these girls can live normal lives today mm. is a testament to how uh, strong they are. hundred percent. And this was all just to completely break them down. This is everything that he does is breaking down their ego. Um, and, and if you read the book. He pits them against each other. There's a lot of mental torture, like throughout this whole period. He's, you know, and again, it was Gina and uh, Amanda's book. Yes, correct? they wrote the book together. Like he had Amanda in one room and Gina and Michelle in another room, and pitted them against each other and say, "Hey, Michelle, you know, Amanda told me you guys did this," kind of just to keep them at odds with each other, right? Presumably, so they couldn't work together and come up with a plan, kind of thing. Oh well, yeah. yeah. If, yeah. I mean, because then it's three on one. Like, you right. want to keep them separate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was a smart guy. I, I read that Michelle was given a dog by him. I don't know if it was a gift or, like, something. Because that was the one thing that I read, too, is that he would he would be nice sometimes and act like, you know, yeah, yeah. he wanted to hang out with them or whatever. And then other times he would be brutal. Yeah. But he was, she was maybe given this dog as a gift. I'm not sure exactly. But it tried to bite him protecting her one time and he just snapped its neck in front of her just all kind of horrible yeah 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 the, i mean the mental abuse rivaling the the physical abuse for sure like we said michelle was the first victim and she was left chained in the basement like that for weeks before she was brought up to another area of the house he would tell her things like i only need to keep you for a couple months or you'll be out by summer or christmas just mental manipulation he also did stuff with her, too, where he would put on the TV and see, like, no one's looking for you. See, nobody cares that you're gone. Yeah. Well, and with Amanda, I mean, we'll get into it, but he did the opposite. He sat there and watched news reports of Amanda with her family and go, oh, your mom looks pretty upset. Like, I, it's just, yeah. Or one time or uh, one time he ran into uh, Amanda's sister at the store. He's like, hey, I ran into your sister at the store today. She's doing OK. It's fucking crazy. Yeah. Like the mental torture is off the charts. Uh-huh. Then about a year later, Casher brought Amanda Barry into the house. Um, Amanda went through the same torture. And at this point, like you were saying, Dave, he brought down a TV. And so Michelle saw news of Amanda that she went missing. And she's like, well, this is obviously her. Casher told Michelle that he had a thing for blondes and Amanda was and Amanda had blonde hair. And then a year later, Gina was brought into the basement and went through the same torture. The only clue that the police had was two calls placed from Amanda's cell phone to her mother. The first one was just a hang up. And then the second one was a man on the other end saying that he would bring Amanda back in a few days. At this point, the FBI was involved and they were able to ping the cell phone tower, showing that the call was made from within a 40 block radius. I don't even think the first iPhone was out at this time, was it? 2004 we're in? With right around then, right? right? But cell phone tower pinging wasn't like it is, you know, today. The right? technology, yeah. you know, where you can get to my house. <laughs> right. <laughs> they had a 40 block radius to yeah. work with. The FBI staked out the area. Actually, one point that they had an unmarked vehicle. It was about a thousand feet from Castro's house. But after eight days, they pulled out saying they weren't finding anything. The FBI really did seem to be invested in this and they spent a lot of time. I, I read in the book that they found this upstairs apartment, 105th and Lorraine there where one of them was taken and they offered to give the guy some money to um, let them put surveillance equipment up in his apartment that they aimed at, you know, at the, at the neighborhood there just for weeks. Right. To see, you know, what they saw, who came by, who did what. But they, they didn't find anything. Eventually, it all got stolen. Really? All yeah. the surveillance. Someone equipment. broke in and stole all the FBI surveillance <laughs> equipment. Like, yeah, that sounds about right. But yeah, they put, they flew in experts, surveillance experts. Said the FBI put a lot of work and a lot of time into this. And they were, which Gina and Amanda were on America's Most Wanted. Yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, yeah, Ariel watched the, the program with them. Uh, what, what's his name? John Walsh? Yeah, John Walsh. Yeah, it's just fucked up. Like, he's so close to them, but like just yeah. in the bubble where it's like he's not a suspect. Like, yeah. who you go yeah, to. Yeah. Right. Like, it's it's like that perfect mix of like, he was, he knew who they were. He's just on the periphery of people. But he wasn't that might have been suspect. suspected. And right. then he did his, his, his stalking and, yeah. and just, you know, hit the marks 
from his standpoint perfectly yeah. to just kind of stay under the radar just and was still in close contact with some of their families to like oh you know I, i'm very sorry and you know anything he would go to help vigils and, and right. help pass and, out and we'll flyers get and yeah. we'll get to that too and you know it's just i don't know it, it just makes it all the more terrifying Honestly, one of the most vile things about this whole story, I don't know if you remember, is that that the psychic Sylvia Brown went on, what show was it? The Maury Show? She probably did. I know she went on Montel a lot back in the day. Was it Montel? Maybe. I don't know. She is. I think it was Montel, now that you say about it. And, and she's they, a what? A vile human being, you said? I think so. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah, she's terrible. So she just preys on shit like this? Oh, yeah. So oh. they brought um, Amanda's mother and Amanda's sister on the show. And they had Amanda's mother on stage. With Sylvia Brown and Amanda was watching the show thinking, all right, she's going to tell my mom, you know, where I'm at. And Sylvia Brown said, no, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, she's dead. She's like in the water somewhere, mm. which eventually led to, you know, Amanda's mom, you know, drinking more and whatnot. And she eventually ended up dying. But people like that are just fucking, and then you're vile fucking, people but but then even more so you're ariel castro and you know this is coming on tv and you sit her down in front of the television and say let's watch this yeah. oh, and he would laugh there's your mom there's your sister yeah now they think you're dead yeah so your hope is gone you might as well just accept that you live here now because they think you're dead no one's gonna come find That's you right. just to break it your is. spirit to break your will and there were other you know during that whole time she was captive, there were, you know, like false stories, like people in prison said, yeah, I killed her and buried her here. Yeah. So there were several times the FBI and whoever else was digging in lots in that neighborhood. He'd be like, look, they're digging right. That's right around the corner. Look, they're digging for you. They're not going to find anything. And he thought it was funny. It's a whole new it's just element insanity. of torture that yeah. I don't think we've ever gotten to on this show. I mean, we've Maybe. talked about terrible stuff. Maybe in Robert Berdella, where yeah. he kept that guy captive for a while and really tortured him. Yeah. But. Yeah. It's just I remember the that episode man. very clearly. Yeah. That thing that happened that I, I remember and it makes very much sense right you now. You don't even know what that name. You, th you think that's the guy at the convenience store at the corner. You don't even know that no, name. Robert, was that the, the high heel guy? No. Nah. Fuck. <laughs> what was the high heel guy's name? Wasn't the high heel guy the, the, the one where the cops crashed into his garage? Yeah. yeah. They didn't even nice. smell that dead body that yeah. everybody else like, could smell. Like, oh. All right. They left like a I'm sorry note on his garage. They pretty much did. They were like, we just want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Drove away. Meanwhile, there was a body hanging. Who was that? <laughs> Jerry Brutus. Jerry Brutus. Okay. Yeah. With See, the, I mean, with the names, nipple, uh, nipples on the Their names are very whatever. close, so it mixes up for me. Oh, yeah, yeah for sure. Obviously. Was Robert Rodella the one who tortured that guy in the room? Yeah. And then the guy jumped out of the bedroom window? Yeah. He, he kept I still that thought that was the time. same thing. But anyways, yeah. So, I mean, that's just, that's a different kind of torture, man. You're literally showing them, hey, all of your hope is gone. That's right. She was just told on national television, your mom, that you're dead. That's. But look, I'll catch flack for this, but I'm sorry, but psychics are not real. And Sylvia Brown's a fucking vile piece of human filth. So did you ever see her 9-11 when she did? I, I don't think Where so. She was telling that lady on the Montel show. She was like, oh, her husband died in the, the World Trade Centers and was never found. And uh, Sylvia Brown's sitting there telling him, telling her like really, really specific stuff about like the office and now he and or I think maybe he was a firefighter. I don't know. He died, but she was giving all these specifics and the ladies like looking at her. She's like, no, none of what you just said is right. And it's like this whole cringe moment on <sighs> Montel. Show. Just disgusting human being. Don't worry, Dave. I'll take the heat off you. Psychics, hypnotists, same level. <laughs> it's all a work. It's a work. <laughs> they just want your money. That's uh, not what I said. But. They can, no, that's why I said I'll take the heat off you. That is not what you said. That's what I'm saying. Go work for Vince McMahon. It's all a fucking show. It's just, I don't know, man. It's just one of the worst parts of the story is that fucking bitch Sylvia Brown and her watching that. Is I like how awful. fired up you're getting now. This is how I feel about Nancy Grace. Sickening. I, I love how fired up you are. It's because they give people hope or they give people these final conclusions yeah. that. Well, you know, they're playing odds because you know what? In most of these cases, yeah, she probably is gone and you're actually called on it. Yeah. But you know what? Sorry, this turned out differently and you're a fucking Does fraud. Does she still have a career to this day? Oh, she's dead. Good riddance. Fucking vile. <laughs> <filth>. <laughs> Woo! I love it when you're fired up. <laughs> Despicable. Damn. <laughs> 
the other really fucking crazy thing, and it's it's really sad, is that Gina's father bought that car, that white Nissan from Castro, and he would go over there every once in a while and drink some beers outside and shit. And Castro would show him sympathy for yeah, yeah. Gina missing. And all this time, she's just chained down it's the basement. unbelievable. Those parents never gave up. I remember seeing them on the news every year. I remember seeing Felix putting up flyers in the neighborhood every year. And I would think to myself, come on, that girl's been dead for, for how long? But never again. He also one time uh, was at a vigil and brought home a flyer from, uh, from uh, Gina's mom. Folded up in his pocket and brought it home and gave it to Gina. Look, look. Got this flyer from your mom today about you being missing. It's fucking I mean, the crazy. guy's yeah. unbelievable. Unreal. The Castro is raping them multiple times throughout this whole this whole ten years uh, with no protection. Uh, I'm not clear as to how many pregnancies there actually were. I know Gina said that she doesn't think that she ever was pregnant, but Michelle said she got pregnant five times over the course of being held captive, and each time she was beaten to have a miscarriage. Uh, things like hitting the stomach with a dumbbell or push down the stairs multiple mm. times. So I mentioned the book was based on Amanda and Gina's notes that they kept and what diaries and whatnot from their time in the house. But in the early days, Amanda started making notations in her diary every day, like how many times he raped her. So as you're reading the book, like each entry, you know, like this day will be like three X, four X, four X. It's just, Ugh. it's hard to read. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a hard to read book. Well, imagine that over the course of ten years, three oh, yeah. times, oh, four yeah. times, you know, five, six, seven, however much it went up to, a day for ten years. This disgusting person that didn't bathe and was just a dirty, fucking, filthy animal. Yeah. Even if he wasn't, though, I know, just, just you know, it, yeah, yeah, unreal. I like the setup we have tonight. You read Amanda and Gina's book, and I focused a lot on Michelle's book. I feel like we're getting the whole uh yeah yeah and i'm here to listen yeah <laughs> <laughs> and shit on hypnotists i guess <laughs> it's not easy to read man i had a tough time no, i would not, i would 100 percent not read that book it was i, I just i yeah. it's, you don't want to hear that amanda became pregnant and because uh she was castro's favorite or at least it's assumed that she was castro's favorite uh she was allowed to keep the baby on Christmas Day 2006, Castro made Michelle assist in the birth of the baby, which took place in a small inflatable swimming pool. He threatened to kill Michelle if the baby didn't survive. At one point, the baby stopped breathing, but Michelle was able to do some makeshift CPR and resuscitate the baby. Mm. So you can do this. This makes me think like Castro can do whatever he wants to like pin them against each other. But then you got like Michelle doing this like, yeah. You know, you know, he's she's being threatened, but she's saving Amanda's baby's life. Yeah. You know, these girls in their own way are bonding over what they're going through. That eventually is what is what happened. I think yeah. more so Amanda and Gina and kind of more than with Michelle. But yeah, for sure. But it's just, you know, you look at this girl who just saved your baby's life. Yeah, right. That's going to, you know, it's going to elicit some feelings. You know, one of the other stories I just thought of from from the book one time, Ariel had his daughter staying in the house. So he moved all the girls out into the garage. It was like 100 degrees out and put them in his van, like chained up in in the same van. He kidnapped them in, in the garage with just like a, a bucket for days, like with a dirty mattress in there. Like and would, would they they were chained up, you said chained yeah. up in the van with a bucket of, mm. you know, filth. How do you for days in a hundred degree? How heat. do you even survive that too? I, I don't know. In a garage which was probably closed, the garage was probably garage closed, was closed with a then, little fan and, plugged in. But yeah. you know, it's recirculating filth air. Yeah, just to illustrate, you know, kind of the the, the conditions. Mm. Amanda having the baby—that's kind of where he he fucked up in, in this in his whole plan because people started seeing him with a little girl. Castro occasionally took Amanda's daughter out of the house, including visits to his mother. She called him, quote, daddy, and called Castro's mother, quote, grandmother. In 2013, he showed one of his adult daughters a picture and said that she was his girlfriend's daughter from a previous relationship. He had told others that she was his granddaughter because neighbors started seeing this little girl around. And this is kind of, at least from 
Michelle's recounting that this is what they all kind of bonded around this this little girl. That I think that's probably this right. Yeah. Kind of brought them all together. Sure. Castro would do things like leave doors unlocked to test the women. Um, if they tried to escape, they would be beaten and tortured. But now he's getting sloppier with some of this locking doors because Amanda's daughter, who's now six years old at this point, was running around the house and questioning things. Can't keep that going forever. You can't keep that little girl just no, locked in no. there. Yeah. On May 6th, 2013, according to police, Castro left the house that day and Amanda realized that he didn't lock the, quote, big inside door, but the exterior storm door was bolted. She didn't try to break through the outer door because she thought that Castro was, quote, testing her again. Instead, Amanda screamed for help when she saw neighbors through the screen. Neighbor Angel Cordero responded to the screaming, but was unable to really talk to Amanda because he spoke little English. Neighbor Charles Ramsey joined Cordero at the house's front door, and they kicked a hole through the bottom of the storm door, and Amanda crawled through, carrying her daughter. Charles Ramsey said that Amanda told him that she and her child were being kept inside the house against their will. Upon being freed, she went into the house of another Spanish-speaking neighbor, and with Charles Ramsey's assistance, she called 911. And I think we have that call, right? We do. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped, and I've been missing for 10 years, and I'm, I'm here. I'm free now. Okay, and what's your address? Uh, 2207 Seymour Avenue. 2207 Seymour. Looks like you're calling me from 2210. It looks like you're calling me from 2210. I can't hear you. It looks like you were calling me from 2210 Seymour. Yeah, I'm across the street. I'm using the phone. Okay, stay there with those neighbors talking. Okay. Uh, okay. Talk to the police when they get there. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Talk to the police when they get there. Okay. I'm on the way right now. I need We're now. We're gonna send them as soon as we get a car open. No, I need them now before we get back. All right. We're sending them. Okay. Okay. I mean, who's the right guy? Now? Who's the guy you're uh, trying? Who's the guy who went out? Um, his name is Ariel Castro. All right. How old is he? Uh, he was like 52. <laughs> All right, and uh, Steven, I'm Amanda Barry. I've been on the news for the last 10 years. Okay, I got, I got that here. I already. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you said what was his name again? Uh, Ariel Castro. And is he white, black, or Hispanic? I'm Hispanic. Hispanic. And what's he wearing? I don't know because he's not here right now. That's when why he I left, got away. When, when he left, what was he wearing? Too young. It's a pity. What? Right, the police are on the way. Talk to them okay. when they get there. Okay. Huh? I need. Okay. I told you they're on the way. Talk to them when they get there. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Hey, dispatcher. I'm a fucking Amanda Berry. Get the cops here now. I have a big problem with the way 911 callers ha- or handlers take their calls. It's not. They're the great. most. You know. Uh, I'm trying to be nice about this. <laughs> I'm sure they get a lot of bad calls. Sure. But you should take every call like it's the most important call you're ever going to take. And I don't think they treat it that way. I would agree. The way they kind of shrug people off, like, tell me your address. Well, no, I'm showing you at this. Well, then why the fuck are you asking, you piece of shit? (laughs) Like, this person is an extreme trauma. And yet you're trying to question them on where their address is. So I don't know. And I'm sorry. Everyone in Cleveland knows who Amanda Berry is. Just stop, dude. So I don't know. I I just I'm sure that I, it's a different profession and you could don't go through a lot of stress, but you should treat every call like it is you're saving a life. That's your job. She got in trouble for that. The 911 dispatcher. Good. Yeah, she kept saying talk to the police. Yeah. Like it sounds like you were rushing her off the phone. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas like in other ones they they want to keep you on the phone. That's what I was going to say. She got in trouble for how she was rushing her because they're supposed to keep you on the phone till the cops get there. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. That, that, yeah, that's infuriating. I, I believe I was sitting at a bar and I saw this breaking like national news. I'm like, I fucking I can't fucking believe it. Yeah. Like after all these years, it's it was crazy. unbelievable. Yeah. Mm hmm. Responding officers entered Castro's house. They walked upstairs. They walked through the upstairs hallway with their guns out, um, announcing themselves as Cleveland police. 
after peeking out from a slightly open bedroom door, Michelle came out into the hallway and jumped into one of the officer's arms, repeatedly saying, quote, you saved me. Soon after, Gina came out into the hallway from another room. Michelle and Gina walked out of the home, and all three women, Amanda's daughter, were taken to Metro Health Medical Center, with Amanda and Gina being released from the hospital the next day, and Michelle was discharged four days later on May 10th. She had been, she was in really bad health conditions. She really caught, I feel like she caught a lot of that, uh, that physical abuse from him. Well, I think they had permanent scars and whatnot from those chains and like, it was fucking brutal. She, yeah, she was in bad shape. Well, so going back to Charles Ramsey, he was the one that uh, was like second to the door, the front door, and was the one that like kicked it in. He kind of became famous and, you know, gave some interviews and stuff. And I think we have, you know, his first interview he did after kind of helping rescue the girls out of the home. Charles, hey, Charles, Charles, let me talk to you. I'm talking with Charles Ramsey. He's a neighbor. Uh, Walk me through again what happened this afternoon. You you, You heard screaming. I heard screaming. I meet my McDonald's, I uh, come outside, and I see this girl going nuts, trying to get out of her house. So I go on the porch, I go on the porch, and she says, help me get out. I've been, I'm, I've been in here a long time. So, you know, I figured it's a, a domestic violence dispute. So I open the door, and we can't get in that way, because how the door is, it's so much that a body can't fit through, only your hand. So we click kick the bottom and she comes out with the little girl and she says, call 911. My name was Amanda Berry. Now, did you know who that was when you when she said that? When she told me it didn't register until I got the call in 911. And I'm like, I'm calling the 911 for Amanda Berry. I thought this girl was dead. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and she got on the phone and she said, yes, this is me. And the detective uh, cook, cook right here. Detective Gregory Cook says, Charles, do you know who you rescued? I said, I said. Now, and when did you see, when did you see Gina? About, about, about five. We're good. So, about five minutes after the police got here. See, the girl Amanda told the police, I ain't just the only ones. It's some more girls up in that house. So they went up there you know, 30, 40 deep. And when they came out was just astonishing because I thought they were going to come up with nothing. I figured, I mean, whoever she was, and like I say, my neighbor, uh, you, you got you got the, some big testicles to pull this off, bro, because we Thank see you. this dude every day. I mean, every day. Hey, how long have you lived here? I've been here a year. Okay. You should come up from? Right. I, Barbecue with, with this dude. We eat ribs and, and whatnot and listen to salsa music. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah. And you had no indication that there was anything hey, going on? bro, not a clue that that girl w- was in that house or anybody else was in there against their will because how he is, is I just, he just comes out to his backyard, plays with the dogs, tinker with his cars and motorcycles, goes back in the house. So he's somebody that you look and you look away because he's not doing nothing but the, the average stuff. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. There's nothing exciting about him. So, well. Until the day. <laughs> what, was, what was the reaction on the girls' faces? I can't imagine to see the sunlight, to be around Well, I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arms. Something is wrong here. Dead giveaway. Dead Charles, giveaway. Charles, thank you very Dead much. Dead giveaway. Thank you very much for your time. And Either she homeless or she got problems. That's the only reason why she ran into a black man. Charles, thank, thank you for being there, man. Charles Ramsey, a neighbor, heard the screaming took action, went and did what he needed to do. The rest is unfolding before us here on CMR. I'm going to send it back to you. Charles Ramsey. Hometown era. Hometown era. Hometown era, Charles Ramsey. Yeah. Fucking A right. Also gives phenomenal interviews. Yeah, he definitely does. He did go viral after that, too, with one of those like auto-tune. He Dead did. giveaway. <laughs> Dead giveaway. <laughs> Just a cool dude. Yeah, and very cool. I, I know. I've known people that have met him now personally a few times and said he's he's just the humblest, coolest dude. And it was yeah. just he was so happy that he was able to help those girls. Unreal. So Castro was arrested on May 6th, 2013. He was charged with four counts of kidnapping and three counts of rape on May 8th, which carried a prison sentence of 10 years to life in Ohio. Two of Castro's brothers were initially taken into custody, but they were released on May 9th after police said they confirmed that they had no involvement in any of this that was going on. 
Castro made his first court appearance on May 9th, where bail was set at $2 million per kidnapping charge, adding the total to $8 million. Additional charges were pending, including aggravated murder for the um, for the intentional miscarriages, uh, attempted murder, assault, a charge for each instance of rape, and a kidnapping charge for each day that each of these women were held. On May 14th, Castro's attorney said that he would plead not guilty to all charges if indicted for kidnapping and rape. A Cuyahoga County grand jury returned an indictment against Castro on June 7th. It contained 30 it contained 329 counts including two counts of aggravated murder for the forced abortions. Did all three women get pregnant at, throughout the time there? Gina says that seem she like didn't. It. So it was and and Michelle did, obviously, and had Mm -hmm. the miscarriages. Did Amanda have miscarriages before she had the daughter? Was not in the book. That was not referenced at all, no. So it was just Michelle Knight that might have had the miscarriages. Unless Amanda just didn't know or want to bring it up. There was a lot of, you know, raping while the others were right there. Like, which is just humiliating. Yeah. Or he would be like... Hey, uh, he grabbed him. Hey, I need you to help me, you know, clean downstairs. And like everyone knew what he was doing. It's just so, I don't know. It's just vile. These indictments covered only the period from August 2002 to February 2007. The county prosecutor, Timothy J. McGinty, said that the investigation was ongoing and that further findings would be presented to the grand jury. McGinty said pursuing the death penalty would be considered following all of these indictment proceedings. Yeah, you're never going to get that convict. That's a tough one. Yeah. Like a death penalty on the like forced abortion murder convictions. I don't think that's going to happen, right? I, would, I feel like that'd be really tough. To that's get. tough. Yeah. I feel like it would be really tough to find a jury, like an impartial jury yeah, that was yeah, going to immediately yeah. sentence him to death, too. After entering a not guilty plea for Castro on June 12th, one of his attorneys, Craig Weintraub, said that although some of the charges against Castro were indisputable, quote, it is our hope that we can continue to work toward a resolution to avoid having an unnecessary trial about aggravated murder and the death penalty. Well, and they overcharge that. That's how they get plea bargains. I mean, that's what they do. Like, all right, pal, you don't plead guilty. We're going to charge you with fucking... You know, capital murder, death penalty specification. So you get them to plead guilty, and that, that's just what they do. That's what they, they love to overcharge. That's what they did with Casey Anthony. Yeah. And she was like, no, nope, I'm sticking to my bullshit. I'm going to come up with a story about uh, my dad's cock in my mouth, and I'm going <laughs> to get acquitted. <laughs> Fucking Florida, man. <laughs> I don't know if I told you guys this. I was in uh, Orlando a couple weeks ago, and I drove by Casey's house because I just I thought it'd be cool to get a picture of Casey's house. <laughs> But jo- her dad, George, he was out front in the yard. <laughs> like, I can't really take this picture. It's really weird. And then we drove around one more time and he was still out in the yard. So I aborted the mission and I do not have a picture of Casey's house. Mm. George would have come down there and beat your yeah, ass. I'm like, <laughs> like jo- I wish there was a photo of George beating your ass. That would have been so great. You wearing a necro shirt, though, while he's kicking your ass. <laughs> I'm like, abort, abort. <laughs> I don't want to fuck with George. That guy's an innocent. Uh, no, I agree. Also, I can't believe you're still living in that same house. Like, yeah, you would think you'd just move on. He's out like, there working in the yard, out. working in the garage. I'm like, no, nope, I went by twice. Abort. That's it. Failed he, mission. So he, he healed up well from that car accident, I guess. He, he seemed Doing fine well. to me. All right. Good for you, George. Uh, Castro's lawyer also said, quote, we are very sensitive to the emotional strain and impact that a trial would have on the women, their families and this community. And following this, Castro was found competent to stand trial on July 3rd. On July 12th, Cuyahoga County grand jury returned an indictment for the remainder of the period after February 2007. This brought the total counts to 977. 512 counts of kidnapping, 446 of rape, 7 of gross sexual imposition, 6 of felonious assault, 3 of child endangerment, 2 of aggravated murder, and 1 of possession of criminal tools. And on July 17th, he pleaded not guilty, which they always say is the smart thing, right? That you should always just plead not guilty. You have to, sure. 
But I mean, in this case, it's indisputable. Hey, pal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. You're guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Look, we know where this is going to end. <laughs> yeah. We're just kind of playing that like, oh, I'll offer 20. We'll offer 10. Yeah. We'll meet you in the middle at 15. You're going right. away. He ended up pleading guilty on July 26 to 937 of the 977 charges against him. Uh, this included charges of kidnapping, rape, and aggravated murder. And as part of a plea bargain, which called for consecutive sentences of life in prison, plus a thousand years, all without parole. Under the plea deal, Castro forfeited his right to appeal and could not profit in any way from, from his crimes. Which I thought that was interesting. I never heard of that before where someone can, um, they forfeit their right to appeal anything. It's good. Good for the future. Yeah. Unless you're innocent. This is also true. <laughs> you shouldn't sign an agreement. But. You should not, yeah. If you're innocent, don't sign that. Look, in this case, yeah, but you know, I don't know how I feel about that. How someone in duress takes that plea agreement and forfeits their appeal. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure how I feel about that. He also forfeited his assets, including his home, which prosecutors said would be demolished. Castro was told by Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court Judge Michael Russo, quote, you will not be getting out. Is that clear? To which Castro responded, quote, I do understand that, Your Honor. Castro also made comments about his, quote, addiction to pornography and sexual problem. Sounds a lot like BTK there. Remember, he always said, I have a sexual problem. Uh, well, this guy got molested as a kid and he kept bringing that back as... This you mean Castro? Castro, like did he? I mean, he would tell the girls like, you know, this is what happened to me. This is why you're here. I'm fucked up. It's not if you my can, fault. If you can speak that, you can understand it. Yeah, and you can work through work it. through it. Right. So fuck that. Yeah, yeah, I don't get that. Yeah, yeah. He also had a bunch of like cash in the washing machine and all that. We that talked he, about that. Yeah, that he yeah. wanted to leave to the girls, and I, I believe they said, yeah, we don't, we don't want his fucking money and. Yeah, he wanted all the assets in his will. He wrote all the assets to be left to them. But like we're going to get to in a minute here, you know, delusional, like he had this perfect family. Yeah. Right. Like this was a hunky dory house. We all were, you know, we were the fucking Brady Bunch over here. Yeah. These are my, this is my family in his mind. Yeah. And they would say like, we're, we don't want to be here. We're in jail. He's like, you're not in jail. Like, this is great. Like you'd be uh, back working at Burger King. This is way better than working at Burger King. Like he had this whole kind of idea that he rescued them kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, when he was going into this whole sexual problem thing, uh, judge cut him off and said that that could be discussed at the August 1st sentence hearing. A law firm representing Amanda, Gina and Michelle released a statement that the three women were quote, relieved by today's plea. They are satisfied with the resolution to the case and are looking forward to having these legal proceedings draw a final close in the near future. Like they gave them some heavy hitter, you know, local attorneys like from Jones Day and stuff. So they really, they really looked at the girls, those girls and took oh, care yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's no, I don't know. Looking back at this, like the victims were taken care of and, you know, there's, they weren't, there was yeah. no injustice to them in any way. And, and from their standpoint, like you got to feel good about that. And then you're just looking forward to it. You know, him getting sentenced and then moving on yeah, with your life. Yeah. You don't want to be in the media anymore. You don't want to hear about it anymore. You don't want to have to relive the horror you went through. Like, Let's just let's focus on now rebuilding our lives. Like reading the reunion stories and stuff at the end of the book. I mean, I'll be honest, I teared up a lot. It was uh, it was not easy to read. I think we're going to get to some of that in just a moment. Yeah, yeah. At the sentencing hearing on August 1st, Castro was sentenced to consecutive life terms in prison, plus a thousand years, all without the possibility of parole. He was also fined a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the court for that house is worth five cents. <laughs> they took all the cash on the washing machine. <laughs> yeah. He still owes like you know nine thousand two hundred dollars. <laughs> The court forfeited all of his property and assets to the Cuyahoga County government. Before his sentencing, Castro addressed the court for about 20 minutes in which he said that he was, quote, a good person and not a monster, but that he was addicted to sex and pornography and had, quote, practiced the art of masturbation from a young age. The art of masturbation. <laughs> it's not really an art. Yeah. Join the club, pal. I didn't grow up to be a fucking pervert piece of shit like you did. 
He claimed that he had never beaten or tortured the women and insisted that, quote, most of the sex he had with them was, quote, consensual. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. So, Ian, you think this is any mental health or is just just him just just trying to grasp at anything? Maybe just distance himself from from. So it's not, you know, he's not. I think he was having that delusion the whole time. I, I don't know. Some of the quotes and the way he spoke to them. I think he, you know, convinced himself that they wanted to be there. But what I like, mean is, like, was he was he doing it to protect himself, like knowing what he was doing, or was he just really mentally I that altered? Yeah, I don't know. I tend. I think to he think, believed it. See, I tend to think he was just doing it to. He knew what he was doing was wrong, and he was protecting himself, like like the abuse thing. Yeah, like if yeah. you, he's remembering what it did to him, and then projecting it on them as an excuse and saying, "This is why I'm doing." It. Like yeah. he's already kind of making excuses. Yeah, you're probably right. So, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't know. A lot I of mean, none of us know the answer. Do that. Yeah. yeah, distance themselves from it completely. You know, right. A lot of right. stuff. But that's but you know some of them they they mentally believe it. You know we talk about the you know the schizophrenics and you know whatever else the uh, people are going through and and you know and there are some people who that just make excuses and try to justify it based on that and you yeah. know convince themselves they believe it. So I don't know. He shifted between apologizing and blaming the FBI for failing to catch him, as well as blaming his victims themselves for getting in the car with a stranger. Oh, yeah, sure. Along with insisting to the court that when he had sex with them, he discovered they weren't virgins. Like that makes a difference. Yeah, right. It's not rape if you're not a virgin. (laughs) Gina was 14 fucking years old. So it doesn't matter. It's right. Yeah. It's just, it's it's just right. disgusting. And the description in the book of of him raping Gina for the first time is just fucking disgusting. And then he would alternatively go back to apologetic comments saying, quote, I hope they can find in their hearts to forgive me because we had a lot of harmony going on in that home. Well, and that's what I mean. Like, he, you know, he's trying to convince himself they were a happy home. Everyone got along. Yeah, they all loved yeah, it. Sure. You're fucking making them watch your mom be told that you're dead. That's a happy home. You know, oh, here's here's you. Be, you're on the missing persons report. We're hey, I saw ha- your we're, sister. We're home. Yeah, I saw your sister at Mark's today. She looked great. Yeah. I talked to her. Yeah. Told her you were well. Yeah. Happy home. Or told her I hope you were well. The sentencing also heard from Michelle and family members of Amanda and Gina. Michelle told Castro, quote, you took 11 years of my life away. I spent 11 years in hell. Now your hell is just beginning. I will overcome all that has happened, but you will face hell for eternity. I will live on and you will die a little each day as you think of the 11 years of atrocities you inflicted on us. I can forgive you, but I will never forget. It's intense. Yeah. And good for her being able to just compose herself enough to kind of get those feelings out. To speak in front of all those people. Yeah. Ariel Castro was found hanging from a bed sheet in his cell at the Correction Reception Center in Orient, Ohio, on the evening of September 3rd, 2013. Where the fuck is Orient, Ohio? I I feel like I've seen a sign for Orient before. I have. I'm like, but I'm just. What's (laughs) Orient, Ohio? (laughs) But I could be wrong on that. That's a new one to me. I feel like that's down south a little bit it ain't up here bro guys we have a fucking <laughs> we have a fucking google machine it, it ain't up here it ain't in cuyahoga county I'll tell you that. so it is just south west of columbus okay. okay it's in pickaway county um yeah i mean looking at the map like what it's county or two south from uh franklin the red dot Okay, so yeah. down, down there in no man's land. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's 71, takes you to that county, right. I, I guess, yeah. but yeah. All right. He had only served one month into his prison sentence and was 53 years old at the time of his death. Prison staff performed CPR on him before he was taken to the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center in Columbus and where he was pronounced dead shortly after. That's your buddy Lex Wexler, Ian, from the Epstein episode. (laughs) Lex Wexler? (laughs) He's the one to pay for that place. Mm. (laughs) The following day, Franklin County Coroner Jan Gorniak announced that a preliminary autopsy had found the cause of death to be suicide by hanging. This guy tortured these girls for 10 years, this fucking 
pussy couldn't even put up with yeah. a month. Mm-hmm. Couldn't even take a month. Ugh. He was probably getting his ass beat or I, threatened I, I, multiple I times a day. I fucking hope so. You mean much like those girls were getting their ass beat and threatened yeah. multiple times a day. They live 10 years and are still going strong and this guy couldn't take it a month. Honest to God, reading that book, I went, I just, I wanted to go dig this guy's corpse up and fucking take a bat <laughs> through his skull. <laughs> this is, you know what? Infuriating. <laughs> this is one of the worst stories we've ever told. We've told tons of terrible stories, but fired up Dave that we've had now twice with the psychic and with this is my favorite. It hits different. I love fired up Dave. I, I, we said it before. It's it's hometown. It's like, hometown. We live it's the neighborhood this. I grew up in. And yeah. it, it fucking infuriates it. me. I love Fired Up Dave. I love it. I want to take this guy's fucking bones and just beat them <laughs> to a pulp with a baseball bat. <laughs> oh. Hey, I'd film the whole thing. <laughs> Going, World Star! World Star! <laughs> Why well, just beating these bones up? It'd be like office space where they take the fax, or the fax <laughs> copier right, out to the right. field. <laughs> right. <laughs> Awful. It's great. I love when you get pissed off. I want to hear more about the psychic. Well, we'll get to that later. <laughs> we'll get to that later. I don't know. Hey, uh, he's, he's already shaking his head. He's so pissed. He does not that like that fucking psychic. fucking pig, Sylvia Brown. <laughs> Despicable fucking human filth. Woo! I think it's a new shirt. Despicable fucking human filth. With Sylvia Brown's face on it. Ugh. Well, hey, I'm not trying to get sued. I just think we need to put those words. And I'll make that will shirt. Know. Fuck people her, man. No. Disgusting. So on October 10th, 2013, the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction released a report suggesting that Castro may have accidentally died from autoerotic asphyxiation rather than suicide. The Franklin County coroner rejected the possibility, standing by her ruling of suicide. The report also said that two prison guards had falsified logs documenting their observation of Castro hours before he was found dead. That's weird. We've never heard that (laughs) story before. (laughs) I've never heard of such a thing taking place. Hmm. (laughs) He wasn't on suicide watch at the time. Much like our friend Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> Should have been on fucking Homicide Watch. <laughs> but uh, Wait, I, thought, he, I thought Epstein was on Suicide Watch. He was taken off like right before. Convenient. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Very convenient. Um, but they were supposed to do routine checks on him every 30 minutes just due to who he was, like the notoriety with him. I feel like you're, somebody's going to fucking shank this guy. <laughs> you better check him every 30 minutes. And that's what you... There are some some theories online or at least social media comments and some things, you know, a lot, there's a lot of people out there that think that this is a situation where the guards just kind of turned their back to it and said, go ahead and do it. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That is not the focus of the story, nor do I give a shit how no. that one ended. Yeah. Yeah. And that's coming from someone who is against the death penalty. I'm still against it, but you know, if whatever happens here happens here and this isn't about him. A consultant's report was released on December 3rd and officially concluded that, quote, all available evidence pointed to suicide, including a shrine like arrangement of family pictures and a Bible in Castro's cell. An increasing tone of frustration in his prison journal and the reality of spending the rest of his life in prison while subject to constant harassment. The Ohio State Highway Patrol also reviewed the case and reached the same conclusion. I I do believe it was suicide. And I do believe it was probably like an Epstein thing where the guards just so. yeah. were like, oh, whatever, fuck him. Like, you know, if he wants to do it, he'll do it. And we're just going to sleep or, you know, yeah. whatever they're doing. Addictinggames.com. Remember that website? Addicting Games? No. No? no. Oh. That was a big What kind thing. of games were on there? Just every, anything. Addi- addicting Games. <laughs> yeah. Like there was poker. Obviously. There was poker. <laughs> there was Pac-Man. Like, I don't know. Just a, there was like a home run derby game I used to play a bunch. Huh. This was years ago probably, you know college days but yeah. michelle amanda and gina put out a video statement on july 9th 2013 thanking the public for their support an attorney for amanda and gina said that the women quote still have a strong desire for privacy and did not wish to speak with the media about everything that happened the cleveland courage fund um, is a bank account set up to help the women in their transition to regular life which collected a little over a million dollars at the time that they released that statement. I can't think of a better 
recipient or someone that would need that more. Before Amanda's disappearance, her grandfather had promised to give her a classic Chevy Monte Carlo built in the year that she was born. He kept the car after her kidnapping in case she was found alive. He still had it for her when she was released. Uh, It needed a lot of restoration done. I think you saw it on the news, Mike, right? So incidentally, we are recording this on, what is it, Thursday, July 15th, 2021. Today on the news, on uh, Fox 8 News, the one that Amanda Berry works for, which we'll get to in a bit, they had a a story uh, where she received today the fully restored car, uh, which was done by students at Max Hayes High School, their auto body uh, program. Mm. They fixed it up, you know, for free and just kind of did it for her. And it took, you know, quite a few years, but she just received it this morning, which was just by happenstance, happened to be the day we're recording, which I was like, that's fucking crazy. Um, How but, wild yeah. is that? It's a sweet looking like black. And I think it was black and orange, either black and orange or black and red. They what, showed it real quick. But what year Monte Carlo, like a real old well, it was one from the year she was born. So it was 86. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because he promised from the year she was born. OK. Yeah. That's a cool also one. the year I was born. Uh, 40 uh, years after you guys. the year I was born. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flip those numbers around and then t- cut them in half. <laughs> 86 Monte Carlo. All right. It's a cool car. But yeah, the news, cha- you know, it showed her, you know, seeing the car. She got all emotional Super and she started cool. the engine and it was, it was really That's cool. That's awesome. Uh, people helping people. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Vince Vaughn, wedding crashers. <laughs> <laughs> Took a long time. It was like eight years to restore that thing. I don't know exactly when they started. Yeah. And like Ian said, they had a bunch of people reaching out. Yeah. But I'm sure it wasn't, you know, number one priority. It was also high school really, kids. So. Yeah. Took him some time, but she got the car awesome. today, which was just a crazy, uh, you know, circumstance, happenstance of us uh, recording this one. Anyways, Michelle talked about some of her time in the house in an interview with People magazine one year after she escaped, as well as her life leading up to her abduction. Since her rescue, she legally changed her name to Lily Rose Lee and began to get Uh, several tattoos as a coping as a way to cope with the healing process she also revealed that her son was adopted by his foster parents while she was in captivity and she wanted to see him but she didn't want to bring him into this whole ordeal that had been going on and she plans to see him when he's an adult she planned to open a restaurant like that was something that she really wanted to do and she really wanted to get married which uh, she did both in 2016 and she hopes to adopt children because of all that abuse and the forced uh, miscarriages things like that she's not po- it's not possible for her to give birth again that's just that's awful it's terrible they took away this, this because of that yeah, you know yes. this chance of having children Amanda and Gina received honorary diplomas from John Marshall High School in 2015. In an interview with WKYC TV, Gina said that she is currently volunteering for the Amber Alert Committee to help families of abducted children, and she still remains in touch with Amanda and her family. I lived two blocks from John Marshall High School when I was a kid. Hmm. Just, yeah, that's no significance or anything. I'm just Hmm. telling you. That was in my neighborhood. <laughs> in, two th- in February 2017, Amanda joined the staff at Fox 8 in Cleveland, where she hosts a short recurring segment about missing persons cases. And you said, did you say it earlier in the intro that she has helped? You said it earlier on, right? That she helped. I think I saw this off air. Oh. Uh, so uh, Amanda Berry's little segments that she does, not little segments, I didn't mean to to minimize them. She does them every day about missing persons. And I've, I've read that, you know, they have found people because of her segments and, you know, reunited missing people with their families. Um, but she's on, I think every day she does a, a missing person segment. She'll record it and they'll, it'll air throughout the day. And that's uh, great. They've helped find, find people because of it. Yeah. She's still pretty active. And I think she might be the most active one, right. In the Cleveland area. I Amanda. think so. I mean, she's on TV every day with, with the Fox right. News. And I saw people say that she's, you know, the, the sweetest, nicest person that, you know, they could ever imagine and work with. And I think Michelle Knight had a lot harder time after this and kind of Amanda and Gina were closer with each other. And Michelle kind of went her own way. And hey, look, I yeah, don't blame anybody yeah. for any which way they go sure. Like after this. 
just go do whatever you want to do and live your life. And, you know, hopefully Michelle's getting whatever help she might need or and or just feeling happy with, you know, what she's doing day in and day out. I will say that crime is surging in Cleveland these days. And actually, a couple weeks ago, uh, Gina got carjacked kind of in our old neighborhood and Hmm. just never ends. I don't know. I bet that person feels real good about them. <laughs> yeah, like, right. Like, asshole. Come on, man. So, yeah, she's fine. But yeah, she got carjacked the other day. Uh, I also, a uh, side note, about, I don't know, maybe a m- two months after this all broke down in 2013 after they they, they found the girls. We uh, I drove by the house, uh, Ariel Castro's house, and it was like late at night. It w- there was an, an event at the zoo and... Um, which was close by and we drove by it and it was when it was like there was an eight foot fence around the entire thing. Mm. The windows were boarded up much. I think like the picture we posted the other day, uh, cops in front of it, but it was late at night. It was terrifying yeah, uh, just yeah. to see. And then as they said, we said in the, uh, th- throughout the outline, they did demolish the home. The initial plan was to build a park there. They have not yet done so, but it is a vacant lot. If you drive down the street, there's the houses and then there's just this open little area. They they said they might build like a children's playground there one day, but we'll see. That's Cleveland. That's not going to happen. No. And then in April 2019, Amanda was reunited with Charles Ramsey, uh, which was six years after her rescue in an interview that was broadcast by Fox 8. And that's the first time they had seen each other since that day. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Like you would have think like at, at, at some point you would have hooked up with him. I don't know. Just to say thanks or. But do you want like the memories? Like, do you want to? No. I mean, you almost want to move you're on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. not that you're. I mean, I'm sure they're thankful. And I'm sure, you know, no, he's open I don't, to I don't it. mean it like that for sure. But yeah, yeah, right. But like, you know, part of you is just like, I don't want to relive that. Yeah, that's tough. And then when you see him, like you don't like the, the flood of emotions you're yeah. going to feel. Yeah, Charles was super selfless on that interview, too. Yeah, She called him. Uh, she said that he was her hero. And he's like, no, nah, I just, you know helped you get out you're the real hero you know you, you guys are the strong ones you know it's interesting for him. in that book they talk about like the first guy that we talk about the first guy that came to the door when she was banging trying to get out uh didn't speak english and i said there was some woman like on the on the street like waving him away saying get out of there don't you know leave her alone don't worry about that like can you imagine but if you they would have just like walked yeah. away and right and then you uh, wonder from her standpoint like the amount of probably bullshit that goes on on that street. Like what did Charles Ramsey say? Like, I thought it was domestic violence. So that wife is probably telling that guy, Oh like, yeah, don't get involved don't get in their involved. issue, sure. like whatever. And that's not the right thing to do, but you know, that's probably what her mindset was. Yeah. And then you get someone like, you know, Charles Ramsey and he's just like, fuck it. I'm going to get you out of this house, beat down the door. And then here we go. And I think what probably gets lost in all that is, you know, after 10 years of captivity, like he would, he used to test them and, you know, stand around the corner and see if they would try to escape and stuff. Like they, they didn't know, like he accidentally yeah. left the door open. They didn't know. They thought That's maybe he was testing them. The amount of courage it takes to go down there and, and how hesitant they were. And they thought like he might've been around the corner or whatever. I mean, it just takes a tremendous amount of courage to actually pull the trigger on that. I agree. I, 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 it's just unimaginable. Well, so fucking kudos to those girls, man. Unbelievable. It's a wild, insane, sad story that, you know, has a happy ending, which we don't get to do a lot on this. Obviously, yeah. their lives were, you know, greatly, you know, disrupted and tortured for 10 years. But, you know, I mean, just think of everything you've done in 10 years like that's it's just it's longer than my son's been alive. Yeah, It's a long <clears throat> fucking time to be chained up in a fucking shithole like that. It's just. To come back from that is just unbelievable. And I was going to mention that we have a, a a radio DJ in town named Rover, and he does a Rover Fest show, like concert. He gets, you know, kind of, you know, big name performers every year. And this was so this was July 2013. It would have been just two months after after these guys escaped there. And we were down at Rover Fest and Nelly was the headliner that year. And he brought Amanda Berry and her sister out on stage and did a whole, you know, thing with them and did a whole, a whole song with them dancing. And it was awesome. But just, you know, to be able to do that two months later, is just unbelievable. 
Oh, it was, mad. I it was cool. What, Fucking what Nelly. Nelly's, Nelly's the coolest her. motherfucker, yeah. man. He, he, yeah, he brought those guys out. It was awesome. Yeah, and for her, like to just to be able to celebrate like that. Like, what is that like? You know, you go from yeah. isolation, your family being told you're dead. Now you got all these people cheering you on. Yeah. It's one I, of the few true crime stories that ends with a happy ending that we've done. I don't know if we can even think. I can't even think of any that ended with a happy ending. I would see those parents on the news every year on the anniversary and stuff. Like, come on. They're dead. I, I, I never think that again. You just don't always know. Well, hold it's that like, hope. It's like Amanda Berry's, you know, grandpa. He kept that Monte Carlo. Yeah. You just get, you just don't know. Yeah. This one had a, you know, as, as sadistic as the story was, it had a good ending. And I think there's some ancillary points on this too. Like the, I think the FBI, I remember reading the FBI rounded up. It was the Cleveland police or the FBI rounded up sex offenders in the neighborhood and t- took a second look at them. And they found that a guy, I think he was on just on that same street down the street ended up, he was listed in a witness report or something for a, a girl that was missing like, you know, years before this even happened and they pegged him and he ended up taking him to a, a manhole like off of I-90 in Cleveland and a missing girl's skeleton was in there. So they nailed him as a result of this. So some additional crimes were solved as, as a result of all this. And there was also that other young girl that went missing named Ashley Summers that went missing in two, she went missing in 2007. They thought that she could be linked cause it kind of fit the same mm-hmm. MO a little bit, but they didn't find any credible evidence with that. She's still considered missing, but no, yeah. yeah, this girl was uh, Christina Atkins and they end up finding her, her skeleton there. The guy that lived on that street, but just the, the it's astounding. The amount of, of young girls that go missing. It's just, I don't know, man. It's, it's insane. It's terrifying. And then you see, you know, stories like this, it's the people, you know, sometimes it's like how many people are locked in someone's house somewhere right, right. now at this moment, right now. Like I drove by this place, you know, this place is right, you know, right on the outskirts of downtown. So in this 10 year period, you know, it's, it's, it's between, you know, West 25th street, which leads to the West side market and Scranton, which but it's, it's a common down. area. Yeah. It's a common I, area. I mean, I don't know how many times I drove by, you know, within it's 50, 500, a thousand feet of this place right. over that 10 year period. It's, it's five, it's a thousand feet away from one of the busiest streets in Cleveland. Yeah, exactly. From West 25th. People drive it's down. It's unbelievable. You know. And West 25th is known for the markets. There's Great Lakes Brewery. There's mm-hmm. all this stuff. This is a thousand feet away. You had three girls locked up for a decade being raped and tortured. I mean, I'm sure all three of us were pretty close to that vicinity at some point. Oh, yeah. In the past 10 years, like probably really. I was close. drinking at a all bar. I yeah. was drinking at a bar five blocks away while these girls were locked up. Yeah. But you just didn't know. You, you know what I mean? Like, it's hard to imagine. All right. Final thoughts. Anything? I know we've, we've been summing, summing it up for a while here, but Ian, you got anything else to add to this one? It's a, it's good to end on a happy note, I would say. Yeah. All three are alive and, and presumably doing well and seem to be doing well. And Yeah. That just the amount of strength and courage it takes to uh, survive something like that. Fucking yeah. good for you guys, man. <laughs> I don't know that I would have made it out of there. I, I would like... We said earlier, like I focused on Michelle Knight and then you focused on Amanda mm-hmm. and Gina, like Michelle's stories. I don't think that I would be able to survive that life. I don't think. No, I'm a big pussy. And, 15 uh, under, no, no. underpass in downtown Cleveland no. in a garbage can. No. And then to go through all this on top of that life and now be married and doing restaurants and stuff. It's cool. Yeah. Good for all of them. Man. Mm-hmm. Strength. Awesome strength. All right. We got some new patrons. Thank you very much to Andrea Brown, Kimberly Magretto, Leslie DeGroote, Sandra Hermida, Trina Kay, Ronald Kuker, Anastasia Schultz, Christina Jandrisic, Kitty Meowst, Matthew Frockins, comma, the Pussy Finder General. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Dre Nasty, Emily Bennett, Emily Still, Julie Miles, Joseph Devlin, Crusty Ass Eater. Mm, that's for you, Dave. Disgusting. <laughs> Heather L. Solis, Fenris Varg, Jim Vance, Patricia Downward, Olivia Carl, Patricio Del Toro, Michelle Blake, Andrew Confer, Joshua Collins, Dalton Poole, Mari, Jared, Ryan Steef, Julia, Jordan Nez, 
Sarah Duras, Kate Perkins, Cindy McGee, Yes Sir G, Luca Graham, Raina Powell, Cole, Meat Tube, Danny Girl, <laughs> Matt Shock, Ryan Shaber, Dean Carino, Kathy Sanders, Josh Grant, Rand Saves Slim Jones 69, Julie, Natasha Fitzgerald, Brendan Reynolds, Everett Abney, Allison Stoffel, Selda B, Tyra Helquist, Johnny Sweat, Lee Dickey, Garrett Maxwell, Laura, Elise Dacken- Dackness, Katie Anderson, Danielle, and Tabor DeRoyn. Thank you very much. We are at patreon.com slash Necronomapod. Ian, what do you got? For iTunes, I have one for Tyler Keen. Tyler said that he uh, he's in summer school. We're getting him through summer school currently. We need a uh, we're gonna need an updated review at the end of summer with those grades. Is he getting bad grades? Uh, Tyler well, did he get bad grades because he listened to us in class. He said, "Hey guys, I failed and got into summer school, but your shows have been getting me through the school days." Mm. All I, right, all right, bro. You, you you better pass summer school. What's this? Tyler. Tyler. You can't listen to us again until you get a 3.0. That's it. <laughs> and send us proof. <laughs> We're blocking your download so you get a 3.0. Necronomapod at Outlook.com. Yeah. Send, send a scan of your report card. Uh-huh. You better get a 3.0. We'll Tyler. frame it and put it in the studio. When I was uh, <laughs> when I was a little kid, I couldn't. I I wasn't allowed to play with my wrestling figures unless I got a 3.0. I would lose my toys all summer <laughs> if I didn't get a 3.0. So you never got to play with them? I got, well, I, I achieved. <laughs> I achieved because of that. <laughs> I needed those all summer, Dave. How else are you going to do SummerSlam with your f- toys? <laughs> he'd, give you, he'd, he'd, he'd jump off the couch and give your mama an elbow in the back of her head so she forgets about your punishment. <laughs> it's one way to handle it. That is one way to handle it. No comment. So yeah, shout out to Tyler. Tyler, hit those books, motherfucker. What are you doing? Getting all dad mode on this kid. <laughs> Jesus. Did you guys ever see the movie Summer School with Mark Harmon from the 80s? Uh, I don't think I have. That's so good. She I don't think it. I have. That's excellent. Get your education, you know, kid, or else you're going to end up being a psychic, right, Dave? <laughs> Psychic is what happens to no talent bitches when they have no other career opportunities. <laughs> He's so mad. <laughs> and then I have another one for Sad Gamer Infinity. Thena T, Miss Homegrown, Gabriel S. Gray, Satard 1991, Triangular Potato Chip, Jesse STA, and Earth's Second Dark Moon. Thank you guys for the awesome reviews. Dave, what do you got? I would like to give a shout out to our man Dean. At JoJo Sports Bar and Grill for getting us uh, our keg for the studio. He's our keg guy. He, is he us hooks up. us up. Dean's at uh, JoJo's Bar and Grill in Medina, Ohio, where we're located. So if you're ever out in the area, stop by there. Great food. Great beer. Great people like Dean working there. Delicious pizza and fried chicken. Delicious pizza and fried chicken. You love their fried chicken. It's really good. Among other things, a lot of their food's good. Beer is also very fresh and cold. Check it out. We're drinking their keg uh, in our kegerator tonight. So uh, thanks, Dean. Uh, new patron, too. Dean. Dean's a new patron. I might, did I read his name? I, I think you did. Yeah, okay. I heard it. Thanks, Dean. Appreciate it. Beer is going down pretty quick tonight <laughs> with this fucking pretty story. Tasty. <laughs> the more fucked up the story, the quicker we uh, put them down. It just tends to happen that way. All right. Anything else? We good? I think we're good. I think so. And again, the long episode. We are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube at Necronomapod, Amazon.com, search Necronomapod, Patreon.com slash Necronomapod. We appreciate all of your support. Thank you very much. All right. You guys ready for a cool down beer? Cheers.